What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Draymond Green Show. As you know, uh, we were off last week. Um, things definitely got a little hectic with the injury and schedule. And so we're just trying to figure all of that stuff out. Here I am. We're back. I am excited. Uh, after a week off, I feel rejuvenated. No, I'm just playing. This is, this is actually always fun. You know, one thing about this podcast space that I've enjoyed is in my interviews, sometimes I can get a get a bit long-winded. And like on the podcast, you actually have time to tell your story and listen to other people's story. And I, I actually love that as, as I can get long-winded sometimes, as y'all may know. Uh, but I am extremely excited about today because we, like I said, we missed last week, but we're coming back with a big ninth episode and we got a great guest. Uh, one of the Greatest scores to ever live. Um, Kevin Durant before Kevin Durant. Uh, Hall of Famer. Uh, none other than than the great Tracy McGrady. And myself personally, uh, growing up, being a fan of the NBA and watching T-Mac uh, get drafted to the Raptors and then go on to the Magic in Houston and so on and so forth. I am excited. And I hope everyone else is excited. I got some, some, some drag them down, knock it out questions for T Mac. You know, no, but uh, no, extremely excited just to have those conversations. I I have just as much fun having these conversations as I hope you do listening. And so, um, yeah, that's that's going to be this week. But as you know, uh, we like to go around the, the association a little bit before we get going uh, with the interview uh, with the great T Mac. And, of course, I can't come on this week after missing last week and not talk about the injury. Um, I went out last Saturday. I played in practice after having missed the New Orleans game, came back to practice, and I was humming. Whew. I was humming. And Coach Kerr, we had two four-minute scrimmages just to get up and down. Uh, I needed to get a little run. Steph needed to get a little run as he had missed the New Orleans game as well. And... Now, obviously, we know Clay Thompson was coming back. And so we practiced that Saturday, everybody, and I'm flying around. Everybody's flying around. We're excited. I got, I had the opportunity because, as you you, you may have heard, uh, all the guys got a, had the opportunity to scrimmage with Clay in Denver um, for the Nuggets game. I was down with COVID. Uh, when that happened. So I didn't get that opportunity. So that was my first chance to scrimmage with Clay. And just like old times, hit Clay with a couple of passes. He knocked him down. Clay coming flying off a step, a step corner screen and hit Clay, knock it down. And we got it rolling. And everybody on that um that white team, I hope they hear this. We cracked them boys. And so after the four, the first four minute scrimmage, Coach Kirk came to me. He said, how you feel? I said, I feel incredible. He said, you look incredible. You Are you you, you going to go again? I was like, yeah, I'm cool. He's like, well, let's, let's get JK in to get JK a little run. I was like, no problem. I feel great. I'm cool. That evening, my calf tightened up. Um, I then went back to the facility that evening, sat in the sauna and, and like rolled out my calf with a lacrosse ball and with a foam roller just to get the, the muscle to loosen up. And it loosened up a little bit. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll come in tomorrow for the game. I'll, you know, get some uh, some treatment on it. Uh, they'll get it loose and ready to go. I'll be ready to go. We got Clay coming back. Excited as hell. And I went to get, you know, the calf worked on and it wasn't really – letting go like I thought it would let go. So I'm like, this is weird. But I went and did my whole routine, getting my glutes activated, everything activated before I got on the court. And when I went out on the court, I went to shoot some jump shots, and I'm like, yep, this definitely doesn't feel right, and shot a couple shots, and then I left the court. And right there, uh, they told me, you're definitely not playing today. Um, there's no chance you're going to play. And it brought me to tears. And the reason it brought me to tears is because – after two and a half years of not playing, uh, having the opportunity to play with Steph and Clay um, and Andre, uh, guys who, you know, who we really, 
especially Clay and Steph, those two guys were here when I got drafted and they had just won 23 games the year before. So built this thing up from the ground. Uh, and then Andre came in year two. And so, you know, we've built this thing up from the ground. And, and in doing that, you share a love and a compassion for one another uh, and an appreciation. And so just as a, I can't say that I was excited for Clay Thompson return as, as Clay Thompson was because he went through the treatment. He went through the rehab. He went through the mental struggles. He went through all of those struggles. I didn't go through those struggles. So I can't say I was more excited than Clay. But I'm sure I was just about as excited or more excited than anyone else in this world about Clay's return. And so once I was given a news that I couldn't play, it brought me to tears because I wanted to share that moment with him. And I wanted to be out there and, you know, like old times, right? Like we're, you know, teams doing great, right back at it. And 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 to, to have that opportunity snatched away, not that Rick or anyone from our staff snatched it away, uh, they protected me, which I am very appreciative of because I would have limped out there and played and shouldn't have been out there. And worse things can happen. You overcompensate and all of those things. And so it brought me to tears. And I asked them, like, well, can I at least just start the game? Like, just to be out there with them. And, they were, and then I said, I said, nope, I don't want to start the game. Because then if I start the game and I foul, that takes away from Clay moment. Like, and I don't want to take away from Clay's moment. And Rick said, no, I actually think it adds to his moment. And that's all I needed to hear was it adds to his moment. And, and so, you know, we were able to get it done to where I could start and then come out of the game. And the calf felt weird. So, like, it just didn't feel like something that, oh, I'll be back next game. So, no big deal. I'll play with them next game. And I also didn't want the whole thing hanging over of, well, well, when would Draymond get an opportunity to play a game with him or start? And, like, yes, I still haven't gotten an opportunity to play with him. But our names were on the starting lineup together, and I played seven seconds. And it scratched the itch enough to where I can focus on getting healthy. But it, like I said, it, it just didn't feel like I would be back next game. And it just didn't feel normal. So I wanted to be out there for that. So to the people out there that were blowing my page up about me um, uh, messing their, their fan duel points up or their DraftKings points up or this betting website or that betting website, whatever, um, I apologize. That wasn't my intention. And to be quite honest, that never even crossed my mind. Um, the only thing crossed my mind was I have an opportunity to share this moment with my brother, be on the court with him as he's coming back. Although I can't play, I have the opportunity to feel that energy with him and Steph to start that game. And then I subbed out to those that won on the under uh, – you got a little lucky. So I, you know, everybody sent me their numbers, and I saw the, other, the, the under numbers were or whatever. Uh, you got a little lucky, and you're not welcome because I wasn't doing it on purpose. So I can't say um, you're welcome because I had, like, again, my thought was never who's going to win their bet or lose their bet. My only concern and thoughts were to play or start the game, and feel the energy with my brother after two and a half years. So that was kind of that. Um, so, yeah, con congrats if you want because um, I'm a nice person. But definitely wasn't my intention to hurt or help anyone. I just really wanted to be out there with my brother. But moving on to the NFL, uh, round one of the playoffs. Man, it's – I love – the NFL playoffs. And I mean, we got Saturday, Sunday, we have Monday night. It was incredible. And I can't do much uh, right now due to the injury. So sitting around watching football is a perfect day for me. And boy, was it a good day. The Niners got the win, uh, which, you know, I'm not a San Francisco 49er fan. I am a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. My Steelers dropped the game. 
But congrats to Big Ben on a on a incredible, incredible career. Uh, won two Super Bowls, which there are some organizations that don't have two Super Bowls. So, uh, I, you know, there was always a lot of talk of like, oh, it's time for Ben to retire. When is Pittsburgh going to force him out? And I must say, I have a, a ton of respect for Pittsburgh's ownership group, their front office group, Coach Mike Tomlin, for allowing to Ben to go out on his terms. You know, you have the argument, people making the argument, oh, he should have been retired three, four years ago. Maybe he should have, maybe he shouldn't have. Who knows? Who cares? The thing I have the utmost respect for is, again, he won two Super Bowls for the, for the organization. There are organizations that don't have two Super Bowls, like Dallas Mavericks did uh, with Dirk Nowitzki. You allow that guy to, unlike the New York Giants did with Eli Manning, you allow that guy to go out on their own terms. And so I have a ton of respect. Yeah, maybe it costs you a year or two. But what was really the likelihood that you were going to win a championship in that year or two? Probably slim to none. So have a ton of respect for the Pittsburgh Brass. Uh, I think what they did in allowing Ben to leave on his terms was great. And I'm sure if he wanted to come back next year, they'd have him back next year. And they should because – Bringing two Super Bowls to a franchise, it's, it's rare. You allow that guy to leave on his own terms. So um, kudos to Ben. Uh, as a Stiller fan, thank you for all that you've done. It's incredible. Uh, it's been a great ride. And now, you know, if this is official, we look forward to the next chapter. Other games, let's talk about that, um, that, that Raider game. You know, I've been in the Bay Area for whew, 10 years now. and Raider fans, uh, Brownie Blends, who's brother of mine, um, big time Raider fan. Raider fans are unlike any other fans. I mean, I'm sure no one listening to this podcast, unless you're a Raider fan, know anything about the Tuck Rule. I st I've been out here for 10 years. I've heard about the Tuck Rule a million times. I still can't explain to you what the Tuck Rule is. But if you listen to a Raider fan and let them tell it, they will tell you that the tuck rule is the reason Tom Brady won six championships or whatever it is, whatever it was with the um, Patriots, that they started the Patriots dynasty because of the tuck rule. And the Patriots dynasty never would have happened had it not been for the tuck rule. Well, we had a similar instance, not quite, but the other day, Joe Burrows close to stepping out of bounds and he drops a dime to the back of the end zone. Now, if you're watching the game, you definitely heard the whistle because I 100% heard the whistle. But when, you, when they slowed it down, the whistle seemed like it happened when the ball was almost crossing the end zone, the, the, the goal line. And then the guy catches it and he's wide open. Did the whistle affect the catch at all? Absolutely not. I don't think if the whistle didn't blow, he was still catching that ball. So I saw one tweet from Brownie uh, that said, y'all think this is going to start the franchise for the Cincinnati Bengals now and they're going to go on to win Super Bowls? I couldn't believe it, but I guess that's what's going to be the same. Now, in saying that, I thought the NFL was dead wrong and those officials were dead wrong for not replaying the down. Did it affect the catch? No. The ball still would have been caught. but. The rule is, in the Verdant Whistle, you have to replay the down. And I thought that was foul that they didn't replay the down. I also, I also thought what was a little more fishy was we can't talk about that till after the game. So, like, what do you do? Do you put a call in and say, hey, don't discuss that until after the game till we can figure out what we're going to say or what our statement is going to be? I thought that was pathetic. I thought it was fishy. I didn't like it. I didn't appreciate it. And I know a lot of Raider fans – didn't appreciate it. So that was uh, a little fishy. And then, although we stepped outside of, the little, uh, outside of the association with the NFL, and coming back to what's going on in the association, let's talk about Job ja Morant. What he's doing, carrying an organization, he's carrying a team, obviously, but carrying an organization, the ball that he's playing, 
Um, I was talking to someone yesterday that said, do you think Ja going to get most improved? I said, hell no, Ja not getting most improved. Miles Bridges should get most improved. And the reason I don't think Ja should get most improved is because Ja this year didn't just become Ja. Like, we knew last year Ja was serious. We knew he going to be a force to be reckoned with. Now, has he improved? Absolutely. Like, you can tell he lives in the gym and works on his game. He's 100% improved. And what I love most is those guys on that team follow him. They follow his demeanor. You know, he, lead, he leads that team and that organization. And that's what I appreciate most about Ja Morant. But when I said hell no about the MIP um, conversation, Ja, in my opinion, Ja was already past that. Let's talk about the MVP conversation. That's the category that I personally feel like Ja Morant needs to be mentioned more in. Um, he is playing at an MVP level, all-star starter, all of those things. He is at that level. I saw him say, I'm him, after one of his and ones. And I think it was against us. I'm him. I would have had something to, a little bit to say about that uh, if I was in that game. But nonetheless, I do think he's him. Uh, he is an incredible, incredible athlete. But even more so than being an incredible athlete, he's an incredible basketball player, and he's an extremely smart basketball player. You know, I like to think that I am one of the smartest guys in the NBA. That's what I like to think. And I feel like when I'm playing against Ja Morant, a lot like LeBron James, a lot like Chris Paul, when you're playing against those guys, like every possession is like a chess match. And like you're making eye contact with that guy because he's trying to see where you are on the floor. He's trying to see what it is that you're doing, what you're getting your defense into or your offense into. And so when you're playing against guys like that, it's like a chess match. No, I'm not saying Ja Morant is at the level mentally of LeBron James yet or at the level of Chris Paul yet as not only two of the greatest basketball minds in our game today, but two of the greatest basketball minds in our game in the history. I don't think he's at that level yet because, you know, that comes with time and mistakes and experiences, playoff series, and, you know, that, that just comes with time. But he definitely has the potential to be at that level and and he's definitely a very, very, very smart point guard, which I think is the driving force in who he's becoming. And so uh, Ja Morant, definitely an MVP candidate. Uh, he keep playing at this level. Who knows what happens towards the end of the season, but he's playing really well. He's gaining respect. I mean, there was just someone, one of their fans, if I'm not mistaken, told him a, a month ago he'd need to go sit down somewhere. So it's beautiful to see uh, and how he responded to adversity uh, and playing the best basketball in his career. Uh, you love to see that. Uh, but without no further ado, um, as I said earlier in the show, uh, we have the great, great Hall of Fame, Tracy McGrady, coming on the show today. Man, obviously we all grow up um, hoping to reach the holy grail of sports, of whatever that particular sport is that you're playing. For me, it's basketball. For others, it may be baseball. It may be hockey, football, whatever it is. But in all of those sports, uh, one thing that they all for sure have in common is, is they have a, a Hall of Fame. And I am honored today to welcome you, the great, Tracy McGrady, a guy who I grew up um, as a young kid watching come into the league, destroy the league, razzle-dazzle the dunks, the jump shots. We all know the, the 13 points in, in 33 seconds. Um, and the list goes on and on. But none of that stuff matters when it comes to the ultimate, ultimate title, which is Hall of Famer Tracy McGrady. T Mac, man, thank you for coming on the show. I am honored to have you, my brother. Uh, it's a pleasure, bro. When I uh, when I I got the notification that you know you wanted me on, it was no hesitation, man. I uh, you know I, I'm a fan. I appreciate you know what you brought to the game, your passion, your love for it, and uh, you know I'm excited to be here. 
Thank you. Right. A fan of me? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. That, <laughs> Every team needs a Draymond, bro. Every team I needs that. that. You, I mean, you the heartbeat. You the, you the leader. You know, the voice of that team. And as you see, you're missed right now. <laughs> you're so missed. <laughs> I, so I appreciate it, man. Get healthy and get back out there because I got y'all winning the chip this year, ain't you? <laughs> hey, that's the plan. We're definitely working on it. No, I appreciate it. Uh, as you know, like I said, as a young kid growing up and, and watching you play the game, um, you know, for for me growing up, I caught you know I caught some of, some of Michael Jordan. Um, you know, I was six, seven, and eight when he won his last three championships, so I remember that. Uh, but but growing up, like. And I always wonder why it have to be this way. And and so I'm asking you this question as well. But growing up, it's like T-Mac and Kobe. You know, yeah. like you, yeah. you're T-Mac, it's Kobe, and that's what you got. You know, the, the, the great shooting guards in our league. And you kind of had to pick a side, which I don't really like. But I'm asking you, why do you feel like it's that way? Not only in our sports, but in sports in, in general as like, Oh man, I'm a Kobe fan or I'm a T Mac fan, as if you can't love both and they're because they're both great players. Yeah, that's that's why, you know, I think the older I get, I don't get caught up in the GOAT conversation anymore. Um, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, th the guys that are in that conversation are GOATs of their mm -hmm. eras. Absolutely. And it's not just one guy. You know what I'm saying? If you want to crown a guy, that's fine. But I don't like to put guys as you know, up against each other because they're, it's their greatness in their own, you know, lane of how they became great. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. We, we just love competition. We love to put, you know, whether it's two figures, two teams or uh, individuals up against each other. That's what we do in our, in our nation or in this world. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I, I definitely understand that. Uh, but, you know, taking this back to the beginning, uh, we got we have a young kid growing up in Auburndale, Florida, um, <laughs> and not not many people know yet uh, who this young kid is. But you know, I, I've I've read uh, the story and watched all the interviews uh, throughout the way. And you said at one point you went from rank one seventy five to number one in the country. Can you tell me about that journey and how that happened for you? Yeah, so um, grew up in Central Florida. I mean, we, we just go through it. So I, I grew up in Central Florida and, um, you know, with my mom, my grandmother, and then I had an older cousin that really, that got me involved in sports. So I don't know if you know this, baseball is my first love, Draymond. That, like, basketball is actually my third sport. It was really? baseball. Yeah, it was baseball. <laughs> I started baseball at the age of five. And then I started uh, football at the age of eight years old. I didn't play basketball until I was like nine, 10 years old, right? Wow. But yeah, so that wow. was my sport. Every year it was baseball, football. And then, you know, I'd go out to the park and play with my cousins because I have a big family and we'll play basketball. But um, that wasn't my thing. So I was just naturally gifted, bro, in, in, in all sports. You know, I, I think God just dropped me off and was like, bro, I'm giving you all the talent. Whichever one you want to play, it's your, your choice to pick. Just make sure you exhaust, you know, the, the greatness out of that. Um, so in high school in, in Florida, I averaged, what, 25 and 12 in my area. A lot of people knew who I was, but outside of that, no recognition at all. And even across the state of Florida, a lot of people didn't know who I was. Um, this guy that had some, some ties with Adidas came down, I was playing spring football at the time, my junior year. And he came and got me off the football fields. Like, yo, I uh, want you to be part of the family, you know, I'm with Adidas, but he's like, you got to stop playing football. We can, you know, hook you up with this gear. I want you to go to the Adidas camp. And I'm like, what? You know what I'm saying? I'm excited. I get free <laughs> gear. What? <laughs> Man, I stopped playing football. So get ready uh, to go to this camp. And I'm hearing about Lamar Odom. Who the hell is this kid, Lamar Odom? They say he's 6'10", he's a point guard. Now, it just blew me away that, you know, uh, there's a kid here that's 6'10 and have point guard skills. I'm like, mm -hmm. damn, I want to see him. Because I've never seen anything like this. This is the first that I'll be able to witness, you know, this type of talent. So when, he was the first guy that I faced. Wow. And 
for me to even get in that camp though was like pulling strings. Sonny Vaccaro mm-hmm. got me in this camp and they gave me the jersey number 175. Right? Uh-huh. I was the last one to enter this camp and it took a lot for me to get in there because nobody knew who I was. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man, I went through that camp, you know, uh, it's just opportunity, bro. It's like, what you going to do with it? And uh, I ran with it and didn't stop. That's that's incredible. I think the ki- the kids of today, I, they don't know about ABCD camp, man. No, and, no. And it's, it's crazy because I always wanted to get invited to ABCD camp, and I, I never received the invite, so I'm still waiting to be 175. <laughs> Actually, I think they're bringing it back, too. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I think they're oh, bringing it back. That's great. That's um, great. Yeah. And so you you then you go on from there and you consider going to Kentucky? Bro, listen. So I went and took a couple of visits, right? And I think Kentucky was my last one that I took. And Derek Anderson was my host that that played in the league. I went up to Kentucky, man, and saw how them kids, them dudes was living. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my God, the Players (laughs) Lounge. They driving fully loaded Eddie Bowers, <laughs> you know, in Kentucky is already, you know, it's, it's, it's already basketball heaven in Kentucky. So I'm like, man, but yeah, I, I was, I was initially going to Kentucky until Adidas came to the table with that big, that big deal. That's incredible. I, you know, what's funny about that is my junior year of high school, my, my high school coach played for Tubby Smith when Tubby was coaching at Tulsa back in the day. Yeah. So my junior year of high school, Tubby was still at Kentucky. We went, we drove down for an unofficial visit and we went to the game. They were actually, ironically, they were playing Florida. Um, and this is Joe Kim, Noah, Torian Green, mm-hmm. Corey Brewer, like mm-hmm. this Florida, Florida. Yeah. When I, te- we, we walked into the arena and college game day was there. We walked into the arena and we're standing next to each other. And in order to hear each other talk, this is just walking into the arena. This, the game's not, it's an hour before the game. It's so loud. We're yelling yeah. in each other's ear, like yeah. yelling to the top yeah. of our lungs in each other's yeah. ear. I couldn't believe it. We watched the game, stayed overnight, got a chance to see the Wildcat Lounge and all that stuff. I committed the next day. My <laughs> mom had my mom had no idea I committed. No, I knew. <laughs> oh, they got you too. <laughs> Absolutely. I knew I was doing something wrong because. When I got home, you know, I just committed to Kentucky. Like, that was a big deal. When I got home, I never said a word to my mom. Like, yeah. mom, I committed to Kentucky. I didn't say a word. My mom is like, before Instagram and all this stuff, my mom was is the person, like, on them blogs that's just, like, subject after subject going crazy. And my yeah. mom saw on the blog that I had committed to, to, to Kentucky. My mom didn't talk to me for a week and a half. Then yeah. finally, after that week and a half... <clears throat> She went down to Kentucky herself, and and she went to visit, and she came back. She hadn't spoke to me, hadn't said a word to me. I mean, we we passing each other like the ships in the night um, in the house. And she came back, and she said, don't ever do anything else like that again. I understand why you committed there. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, it was, um, it was very impressive. You know, yeah. being on that campus and witnessing that as a 17 year old kid, I was blown away. I was like, yeah. I, I can't see anything greater than this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and I was like, this is where I'm going. This yeah. is where I'm going. And until Adidas came to the table, like that's where I was going. It was, but that's my adopted school. You know, I, I still yeah. suck it these days, um, watch them. But yeah, man, I, I I missed out on that. Do do you have any regrets of, of not going to school as a as opposed to to going straight to the league? You know, I used to get that question a lot uh, when I was playing. You know, because all my my teammates would be, especially during March Madness, they represented mm-hmm. their their alma maters, and uh, I, I think that's the really the only time that I felt it. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I I felt left out. Like, damn, I don't really have no dog in this fight. You know, and I just see all the love and the the, the trash talking that's going back and forth, especially Absolutely. when you got two guys from the same alma mater and they playing in the tournament. It's wild <laughs> shit talking. You know what I'm saying? And I miss out on that because I love that. 
Um, but that's really the only time that I felt it. Other than that, nah. I mean, it's, you know, I wasn't a school type dude anyway, sitting in fucking classrooms and writing papers. Man, fuck that, man. You got $12 million? Are you going to sit here in these classrooms, waking up early in the morning, attending class? Nah. Let me go get these $12 million and, and, and compete against the greatest in the world. I respect that. I always, um, I always talk shit to Jermaine O'Neal. Uh, <laughs> That's my brother. You know, I absolutely. Who's one of my vets. Uh, I played with J.O. my second year in the league. Took me under his wing a lot like Jared Jack my first year. Took me under his wing. Showed me the way we still tight like this to this day. But um, I used to always talk junk to J.O. around that time. Like, yeah, yeah. J.O. them Spartan dogs coming. Yeah. And he like, oh, this J.O. Oh, fuck that. I went to I went to university cash. I came and got this money. I went to <laughs> university cash. I'm like, J.O., guess what? <laughs> We all getting money now, and no I got doubt. a chance to experience no college. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but speaking of speaking of Jo, um, before we move into your career, uh, y'all have started an an, an agency. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us more about that because I think it's an incredible thing, and uh, two obviously goats uh, that's done their thing in this league and now leading the way for these this younger talent. Yeah, man. I, I think you know um, when you you be what 20, 24, 25 years in this game. Um, you learn a lot, you see a lot, and uh, you, you hear a lot of, of what's going on. Both of us have, you know, AU programs. So it's, it's a lot of information that comes out of that. And during the pandemic really just gave us the opportunity to do something together that's very impactful for the culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was doing ESPN, so I was back and forth traveling from Houston to L.A. to do the jump with Rachel. And then when the pandemic hit, it just gave me an opportunity to just, you know, sit down and kind of recalibrate my thinking on trying to venture off and do something else. And I was still in contact with J.O. And it's like, man, we need to, you know, uh, put together an agency and, and really save a lot of these guys out here of, of you know, the misinformation that they're getting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what we're doing, man. We, uh, we started it. We're, we're doing well. We got some kids on NIL deals that are in college. Uh, we're talking to some really, really uh, elite players. And it's, it's about just really being, you know, we got the mentorship between, you know, J.O. and I, who we played the game at a high level, understand the business. And then we got some guys on our team. Uh, from your era, Silicon, Silicon Valley, that are, are part of the ownership that, you know, is is, is advising us and, and, and the kids and the opportunities that can bring. So just collaborating together with those guys and, 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 and what we're doing, man, it'd be very impactful for these kids uh, coming out of college and, and getting their uh, journey started in the NBA. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, going from high school, college, and now to your NBA career, uh, ninth pick in the 1997 draft. And I know for me, I got drafted to obviously go to state. And I had never left the state of Michigan. I spent the first 22 years, I mean, obviously, you know, AAU and all of that stuff. But I spent the first 22 years of my life in the state of Michigan. And when I came out here to California, I was homesick as hell. I felt oh. like I was, you, you could have dropped me in Europe for all I knew. Like, I, I had no idea what was going on out here. I was homesick. Everybody I knew was still in Michigan, so they three hours ahead. I, by, by 8 p.m., everybody sleep. I got nobody to talk to. So then I'm going to sleep at 9 p.m. my rookie year. And you got drafted to the Toronto Raptors, which is a totally different country. And basketball then wasn't what it is today in Toronto. Dead. Tell me about that journey and, and how was that getting drafted to Toronto as, as an 18-year-old, you now going to a totally different country to play basketball? Now, first of all, you left the cold weather to go to some nice weather. You know, from <laughs> Michigan to damn, you know, San Francisco. I left Florida to go to Toronto. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you can imagine I, I, that like, I wasn't used to that word driving in the snow, sliding on like the slur, the slushy streets, like, bro, I was out of territory. You know what I'm saying? And you know, the, the legal age was 19 years old. I still wasn't legal. Um, <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a culture shock. 
you know what I'm saying, uh, from, from all angles. Like, um, it was a hockey town, didn't really, you know, get a lot of love from basketball fans. Um, you could do something spectacular. We played in the, the, the Sky Dome, which was a baseball stadium where the Astros play. So you got, you know, 40-some thousand, you know, seats in there, and it's only probably 7,000 people in there. So you can, wow. only imagine, <laughs> you, you can only imagine, you know, you do something spectacular, and it's like crickets. You know, like, what the hell did we just see? We don't know what that is. We never seen that before. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was tough, man. I had a, I had an old school type mind uh, coach in Daryl Walker, who was uh, very challenging and uh, we really didn't, really didn't click. You know what I'm saying? And um, he, he made it tough for me. I mean, to, to be 18 years old and get criticized from your head coach that you'll be out of the league in three years, you can only yeah. imagine, you know, how damaging that could be for a kid entering this league. And, you know, back then it was some grown men still in this league. Right. You know, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I had some great veteran players that, you know, really kept me level headed and, and, and really helped me through that process. Uh, first year, like I said, it was challenging. And I think Isaiah Thomas, you know, who was the president at that time really saw how, you know, Damage, I think I was the first half of the season and he had to make a change. So we got rid of that coach and mm-hmm. our assistant coach, Butch Carter, took over, who gave me structure. Right. Yeah. There was there was some structure now, kid. You got to do this. You got to do that if you want to get, you know, playing time. And I understood that. And that's what I worked towards before. I didn't have any structure. It was like, OK, what? Well, it's like, what, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. Uh, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I'm, it was left for me to figure out. Um, but when I got structure and knew what my assignment was, then that's when, you know, the the turn happened. My second year, we drafted Vince Carter, which Mm -hmm. is my cousin, and that helped with the the transition. You know, him coming in right away had a phenomenal rookie year. So I was in that shadow like, thank God, take a little bit of this pressure off me. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. (laughs) Um, Coming out of high school, take some of this pressure off me. So he had a phenomenal rookie season, was the rookie of the year. I'm talking about the shit that he was doing was just incredible. So it was, it was bittersweet. I mean, I was taking a back seat to my cousin, but also I was learning along that process to somebody that was, you know, really going into startup, you know what Absolutely. I'm saying? And in, in, in his first few years of the, of the game. So when my opportunity came to, to be in that role, I knew how to handle it, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's just, it's good. It's always good to have, Real OGs around you. I had Dale Curry, you know. Mm, yeah, uh, absolutely. I had Antonio Davis, Kevin Willis, Charles Oakley, D. Brown, Muggsy Bowles. Like, I, we had some vets that kept our ass in line and showed us the way. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and, and that was so impactful uh, for my career moving forward. And I, I can't leave this out. My boy, Doug Christie. Man, I used to play Doug Christie, bro, every day, one-on-one. Really? Every single day after practice, bro. Let's get it. One on one. One on one. That's and, interesting. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's how, you know, I, I really gained confidence and really perfected my one on one game and my skill set. That's interesting because for a lot of these kids around, uh, they don't know Doug Christie was a hell of a defender. Hell of a defender. Yeah, Relentless. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Duck. So y'all brought Vince in. By the way, I know I know those after practices, you and Vince. Who was more athletic, man? You or Vince oh, at no. that time? Vince. Vince. <laughs> I, I, I'm not fucking with him. He was incredible. You know, before we realized we were cousins, I played on the junior team Florida, and he was on the big boys team Florida. So I used to play before him. And... I used to, the shit that I used to see him doing in high school, like damn near touching the top of the backboard, looking down and dropping the ball in the basket. Like it, it was incredible. Incredible. Wow. A lot of people like Vince in high school, bro. I think he broke his right, his wrist in the state finals. He broke his wrist and dropped 35 with the left hand. What? Yeah, man. Vince is basketball, bro. He's one of the most talented dudes ever. Yeah, Ever. yeah, Ever. I agree with that. I've always told people, like, and from just from what I can see from afar, 
Like, yo, Vince Carter has to be one of the most talented players that ever stepped foot in the ever, NBA. Ever. Ever. Yeah, yeah that, it's, it's incredible. But um, so now you look at today's NBA, right? You, you're coming out 6'8". Uh, do you think today's NBA, you, you would have thrived even more than you did <laughs> when, on, when you played? Boy. Because I think so. I think so, because Drake. you just look at the game, right? Like, the way you play, all the hand checking y'all have to do. See, a lot of guys get mad when it went, when, 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 when the guys from before us say, oh man, the league's soft today, or they could, the reality is the league is soft today. It, 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 it is, I mean, let's call a spade a spade, it is. It's, the rules are a lot different, you know what I'm saying? And it, come on, man, guys shooting, Three pointers are shooting shots now, and you land on somebody's foot. It's a flagrant foul. Like Absolutely. how the hell you contest shots without you know what I'm saying? Like that. The the rules make the game soft, not the players. It's the rules. Yeah. That's what we're Absolutely. talking. Absolutely. I think people miss uh, informed that you know we're talking when we say the league is soft. We're talking about the players. It's the rule changes I that agree. we're talking about. Um, so yes, will I thrive? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean. You got to think, in our era, bro, some of the scores were 75 to fucking 76. Yeah. You know, finals were in the 60s, right? And yeah. I have 30 points. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have 35 points of that. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man, I mean, there, there's no question, bro. You can't impede my progress. And it's not like I was just a guy that, you know, scored with the ball in my hands. No, I was yeah. catch and shoot as well. I did everything. You know what I mean? So, yes, I will definitely thrive in today's game at a high level. I agree. Is is there a player in today's game uh, that you see that remind yourself of you? I mean, you got PG, um, KD. uh, Those those two I can think of um, that really reminds me of myself. Um, KD is just a different breed, though. The way he shoots the freaking ball, man, he just... Yeah, he, he's it's just unbelievable talent. Uh, but but PG as well, you know, those guys being able to score at multiple levels. Yeah. No, I, I, I like PG game a lot. And I, I like that comparison. Just the way y'all both handle the ball, shoot the ball, get to the cup, athletic will put you in the rim. Mm-hmm. However you want it, you getting that. No, yeah. I, I definitely respect that. But uh, just just going back uh, some in, in your playing career. So you had those years uh, with the Raptors. And then you move on to Orlando. And I love to hear your perspective, but from my perspective as a young kid watching, I felt like, like you said, you went to the Raptors and then Vince came and you and you were in the shadow. And all of a sudden, to me, like it it really took me to like really brush up on my history and like go back and actually to realize that, hey, T Mac is actually older well not older but you were older than Vince as far as Coming years the in the league. league yeah but when Vince came in it was like you was pl- you was in the background and playing the yeah. shadow in Toronto because for me watching all of those years I felt like your career really took off when you went to Orlando like mm-hmm. that's when Tracy McGrady became T-Mac when you went to to Orlando can you walk me through that yeah so it it you know, it had nothing to really do with Vince, be, you know, me being in Vince's shadow. Um, mm-hmm. My third year in Toronto is really when I turned the corner and really showed that, you know, all right, this kid is really, really talented because uh, I averaged like 15 points for that season. Was, I was like the third or fourth option for that team. And then in my first playoff game against the Knicks, I had like 26 points. Like I, I balled out. Um, had a really good series against a tough New York Knicks uh, team. But it was so much internal, you know, problems that was going on that people didn't know about. And then also, I mean, Toronto was competing against Orlando, which, you know, I'm, I'm from that area. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So it had nothing to do with Vince. This is just, like, I want to go back home because I remember when I was a kid, I used to drive by the arena and I used to tell my mom, I'm going to be playing in there one day, right? Yeah, so this absolutely. opportunity had presented itself. And G Hill was there in Orlando. I thought we was going to get Tim Duncan. But even just myself and G Hill, you know, it's like, damn, we're going to be all right. I got this. This is a, <laughs> the perfect move. Um, and then we know what happened with G Hill. You know, he had the... <clears throat> 
the the ankle problems the year before he joined, you know, Orlando and Detroit, he uh, broke his ankle. So it was like, here are the keys, young fella. Let's see what you got. <laughs> drive us. We don't know. We don't know where we're going, but you got the keys and you bought the drivers. Let's see what you got. Um, you know, and I, I put a lot of work in that that first yeah. year I was with Orlando off season, like to to really uh, push my push myself to exhaustion to you know in, improve on every aspect of my game. And I surprised myself, Dre. I, I'm not even going to lie. I think I averaged probably 26 that year. Like it was wow. the biggest uh, point differential from, you know, one year to the next. And it was just incredible what I was able to do. I mean, that was just a manifestation of the work that I put in that off season. And then, you know, the maturity and the confidence grew to another level to where I just felt, you know, extra comfortable out on the basketball court. Yeah. And you won most, most improved that year, right? On most improved that year, yep. All, All NBA, NBA second team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it, was, it was a lot of stuff thrown at me that year. And I was, and that's when, it, you know, it, it, it's, I don't know if there was a game or what it was that really had me like, okay, I belong. I, I belong here and, and, and this is what it's going to be. But, you know, I, I think competing against Kobe you know, around that time and, and holding my own because Kobe is, you know, in his, if it was my fourth year, he's in his fifth year and he's, he's that dude, you know what I'm Absolutely. saying? That's, that's the number eight with the fro. He, he was that dude. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was that, he was that dude. So I'm like, damn, if I can, he's the bar. So if I'm competing against him every night, oh, okay, I belong here. This is what it is. Right. So mm-hmm. it's just, Staying focused, sacrificing, and and, and really understanding, um, you know that these these folks are really counting on me. And to to back up, I think I'm the first guy to be a non-starter to sign a max deal. Like I didn't yeah. start. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even start when I was in Toronto, and then I went to Orlando and signed a max contract, which is insane. Insane. Who who, who was the GM that gave you that deal for uh, Orlando? Yeah. That was uh, <clears throat> that was uh, gosh, who was it? Was that Gabe? Yeah. Oh man, I don't, I don't mean to take you back like that, but he deserved a lot of credit. Oh, a man. lot, a lot. Like um, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was Daryl Morey that brought James no, Harden no, into no. Houston. Dar- well, yeah, Daryl. No, no, Daryl Morey didn't bring me to Houston. No, 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 no. Brought James Harden into Houston. Remember, yeah. James was coming yeah. off the, like. For I'm just comparing those two signings where you got two guys that are like those dudes in the league coming off the bench on their team before, and yeah. you get those guys the di- the deal that you got, and yeah. then fast forward to James getting that deal. Yeah, like you you got to get those GMs a lot of credit to see that because it's not like oh we gave this guy this deal and and, and like it was pretty good like nah yeah. you gave this guy a deal and they are franchise players. Well, well. The difference is, I, and, and with James, you saw it with James. Yeah, that's you know what true. I'm saying you you that's saw true. it. You saw it on display with James for years until that's he true. got his deal. With me, you only saw it one year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like that's really true. only one year because my first two years, I really wasn't playing that much. Yeah, but that third year, that's when I started, you know, uh, playing a little bit more. But I still was coming off the bench, so you saw the potential with James. You absolutely. Knew yeah, that he yeah. had game. Yeah, you knew for sure. No, yeah. definitely. So then you 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 go on to Houston. Uh, you you get traded to Houston and you team up with Yao. And now at that point, it's like a lot of people don't realize back then you you had to have a good a good guard, a great mm-hmm. guard, and a big man. And mm-hmm. that was that's where you started building your mm-hmm. championship team was with a guard and a big man. And you team up, and you think you go team up with Yao, young Yao. How was that experience? And, and you going in with the, with, with Yao and, and going to Houston? So the first the, the first uh, season was pretty challenging, right? Because you got to think I'm coming off two scoring uh, championships, right? Um, no big man at all. Um, well, at least we didn't play through a big man. So I get to Houston, and the first thing Jeff Van Gundy tells me, he was like, 
you know, you're not going to lead the league in scoring. <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks for damaging that shit for me, Jeff. Like, we, damn, bro. Like, you know, we, we got to get the big fella involved. So I'm, I'm cool with that. But it was, uh, it, it was an adjustment because the tempo was a little bit slower. You know what I'm saying? We got a 7-5 guy that we got to play through, get him involved. And uh, it was a, just a different style of offense. Now that the, the paint is really, uh, you know, clogged up. Um, so I got to find, you know, new ways of, of, of really getting my game off um, and those opportunities. So it was um, the foundation was built, but we didn't have the pieces around us. So we got off to a, a slow start, bro. We, we wasn't good at all. I'm talking about like we was a below 500 team. Then wow. we started adding bits and pieces, you know, some shooting John Barry and the David Wesley's guys that can, you know, take the pressure off myself and Yao, kind of open it up a little bit. And then we started to get on a roll and, and, and look like a real team. Um, but it was, and, and Jeff, Jeff and Gundy had to, to really <clears throat> open up his, his offense and, and, and expand his mind a little bit too on the mm-hmm. offense, man. Like he's a defensive minded guy. Like when you talk about preparation, like it's, it's nobody better. Like he he is phenomenal in that area, having you prepared uh, for games, playoff games, like for a season. He he's he's phenomenal in that. Very very precise in practice. Um, he's one of those guys that you'll come in one day and don't touch a ball, line your ass up on the wall, and he'll go from one to fifteen and tell you what your role is on the <laughs> team. Like he was that type of dude. You can't get on the court unless you uh, you know. I have the the right amount of body fat. Like that's that's what. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that that's what he was on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You your body fat had to be uh, at a certain level for you to even get on the court. So, well, I think <laughs> I think it's one team like that now. Maybe Miami. Uh, Miami. Miami. <laughs> but that's that's all the pedigree though. Pat Riley, yeah, Jeff Van yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's that's Absolutely. all the pedigree. Uh, but that's what he was on, man. Um, so it it was. I think once we put it together, it was fun playing with y'all. I, <clears throat> just to see a guy at that size, so skilled, Draymond, left hand, right hand jump hook, shoot left, right shoulder, shooting 85 from the free throw line, can hit the 16, 17 footer, can pass. I was like, shit. You yeah. know what I'm but what, what really hurt us, though, is when that transition started happening with small ball. Yes. Phoenix and, and you know, uh, Stat, um, you know, Steve Nash, Sean, Mary and Quinn Richardson and them guys. And then Dallas started doing it mm-hmm. and Utah started doing it. It was tough. It, it, yes. it was tough. The league started getting really, especially West. Yeah. It was really challenging. We went on a 22 game win streak, bro. Wow. We went on a 22 game win streak. I think y'all got hurt in like game number 12. And we ran off, you know, 22 straight. But that put us maybe one or two games in first place. That's how challenging the Western Conference was. Wow. Did you hear what I said, bro? We won 22 straight. And it only put us up one or two games in first place. That's cra- <laughs> You're going to lose at some point. <laughs> <laughs> like, that shit was crazy, man. It was crazy. West was That's, so deep, bro. And Chris Paul West. was in New Orleans. He had them boys run, uh, running, you know, crazy him and Tyson Chandler. Put yep. on your trap shoes. That's insane, man, to think that that's where the lead, that's kind of where that change started to happen. Yeah. T- tell me this. Tell me this. Do you, your, your business, as you have the hat on, and it looks like uh, an Adidas hoodie. Yeah, yeah. Your business, do you think there was a huge benefit for your business, your Tracy McGrady apparel business, and just your brand as a whole, and playing with Yao and the influence that the the Chinese have on the sneaker business, the NBA business, but just your brand as a whole? Did that grow a lot from playing with Yao and his influence in China? Yeah, yeah. Um... It, it enhanced it, I will say. Okay. Uh, back back when I was in Orlando, I had the number one selling jersey in China. Wow. Right? Yeah. This, this is when I was in Orlando. Before I even teamed up with y'all, I had the number one selling jersey in China. 
Um, because I used to go over there every year since I think my first trip to China was like 1999. And from that okay. point, I just kept going every year. So mm -hmm. I saw the transformation even in, in China, how, to, how, how they related to the basketball fans. Right. I just, I, I saw that whole transformation. Um, so, but when I got to, yeah, of course, you know, being his teammate, being a part of the first China games in 2004 yeah. for us to go over there with Yao, saw how he was just a guy. Yeah, it, it 50X my brand, mm -hmm. for sure. That's, in, that's in, insane. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of people didn't understand the impact that China has on the NBA, whether well. it's a personal guy's brand or, or whether it's an NBA at whole. Yeah. And obviously we saw the effect of that uh, with the Daryl Morey tweet, I think, what was it, two years ago now, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And that, that was kind of the first that people, first time that the people outside of the NBA realized how important China yeah. is to our game. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they're, they're, they're really important. I mean, you're talking about the TV, TV money that they give to the NBA, you know, mm -hmm. for, for streaming and uh, just – that relationship has has grown so much, man, over the years. And, you know, they're, they're well, well aware of, you know, what's happening here in the States. And you just got to be cognizant of some of the comments that you make because it can be damaging to our, our brand, everybody brand, really. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Some of those comments that we make towards, you know, the Chinese people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and ultimately, you, you don't want to disrespect anyone. And yeah. as as someone who is very outspoken, like I'll speak on anything that means something to me and that yeah. I have an understanding of. You you when you when you start dealing with world politics and world issues, you really have to understand everything that's going on because right. and, and the the backstory, you know, the history. Because if you don't, you could just be speaking on one instant, you know, one one thing that's going on. And you don't quite know the whole story, and then mm -hmm. it, it, it gets yeah. all screwed up. Yeah, and you and, and it, it, it makes you look foolish. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So you got to do your research and get you know everything from both sides to really be able to speak on it and articulate yourselves in those matter. And that's why I, I just leave it alone because it. I don't want to. I don't want to say something that's going to be damaging damaging to my brand if I don't have you know, the full story, the full backstory to it. Absolutely. No, I, I definitely understand that. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I, I spoke about Chris Paul. And, and I said something about Chris Paul because you always hear people say, man, that guy didn't win a championship as if that, if, as if that unvalidates greatness. I love, I, I'm glad we about to have this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and, and I said something about Chris Paul a few weeks ago, which was Chris Paul is a winner. I don't care how you slice it. I don't care what you say. And the first thing that people will say is Chris Paul isn't a winner. He hasn't won a championship. As someone who has, I understand, number one, all of the things that has to go right in order There's to win a, a championship. There's a lot of moving parts. Like, <laughs> you talk talking health, you're talking everybody clicking on, like, and, and it's not just, like, players clicking. It's the front office Man, with the man. coaching staff, everybody, right? And and I was saying, like, Chris Paul is a winner, and people try to take that away because he having not won a championship. A lot like yourself. And I was watching a podcast yesterday, um, Carrie Champion. Um, Jalen Rose went on Carrie Champion's show uh, podcast, Naked, and she asked him a question along the lines of, winning a championship and do he wish he had of would that have validated him or some and he had a great answer but I want to hear your take on it because you you won your whole career you won down there everywhere you played but you didn't win a championship and people try to lessen who you were as a basketball player and yeah. I wanted to hear it from you Draymond I could go and I could go to any country in the world bro and I'm recognized absolutely anywhere I'm well respected uh, in the streets, in the corporate <laughs> corporate America. I'm well <laughs> respected, bro. Um, but here's what I say about that. Like, like we were talking about, there's a lot of moving parts that has to come into play to win it to winning championships. Absolutely. 
it, what what my game and how I play, you don't think if I had the right pieces around me, I couldn't win a championship. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Like I was I wasn't sorry. And like I was one, bro, I was one of the top players in the league. I just didn't have the pieces around me. If you and 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 it's it's crazy because people really forget um, you know, in certain areas. And, and, and certain guys' careers. If you look at how great KG was the, the first, you know, 12 seasons of his career, right? What he had to do, he went and joined Paul right. Pierce well, and Ray yep. Allen took that championship. But, but before that, he was phenomenal. Right? Absolutely. Phenomenal. But, you know, he, he didn't win no chip until he teamed up with those guys. What happened when, when Shaq left and Kobe was, was there for two years? What Kobe did he do? struggled. Go struggled, struggled a lot. They didn't make the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken. Struggle. Right. So yeah. people, people forget about that, bro. You need the pieces <laughs> around you to win championships. Take it from me. I, I, but, I understand it all too well. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so no, but, but you're a key part to that. But here's what I say to those people. I was all NBA. I led the league in scoring, you know, um, at that time. I was considered one of the best players in the league, right? I had absolutely. I, I, I was Adidas top selling guy. Mm-hmm. I was one of the number one selling guys in China, right? I had mm-hmm. multiple endorsement deals. If I had won a championship in my prime, Draymond, the impact that that would have had on me, my life wouldn't have changed, bro. Mm-hmm. My life wouldn't have mm-hmm. changed. You know what I'm saying? Because absolutely, I, I had a, I was I had everything, but mm-hmm. that. But you look back when I got drafted, the impact that that had on me. Mm-hmm. Retiring my mom at 35, 36 years old. Retiring my grandmother from being a custodian for thirty something years. Retiring my dad. You know what I'm saying? Like changing the complexion of my family. That type of impact that that impacted me, right? Absolutely. I know it's 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 it's, it's, it's a difference, but I'm just saying that if I had won a championship, my life really wouldn't have changed. It, it wouldn't mm-hmm. have changed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I would have made the top seventy five, but fuck all that shit, man. I'm a hall Which of famer, bro. I'm a mm-hmm. hall of famer. So, like, let's 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 have a, I mean, like, let's have a real conversation, people. You know what I'm saying? Y'all looking at championships. There's a lot of great people ain't winning no fucking championships. You don't think Charles Barkley or Patrick Ewing ain't have the talent to win the championship? Yeah. Like Carl Malone ain't win the championship. What are y'all talking about, man? Y'all, y'all so caught up in fucking... I tried to win one. I worked mm-hmm. my ass off to try to win a championship. It didn't happen <laughs> for me. You know what I'm saying? But let's talk about impact. Mm-hmm. Impact. That personally wouldn't have... It wouldn't have impacted me that much as me getting drafted and what that impact was for my career, if that yeah, makes nah. sense. And and to your point, there's a lot of great players that haven't won, and there's a lot of bums that has ended up on a championship team. <laughs> so it, it it's not it's not apples to apples. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not apples to apples. Hey, like, come on, that's for certain. Yeah, man. Like, listen, bro, it's, it's hard as hell to win a championship, man. Absolutely. It's hard as fuck to win one, you know? But Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. Do I wish I won one? Absolutely. But it's, you know, I, I, I don't lose no sleep over that and feel like that's my validation. When I have the great, late, the, the late, great Kobe Bryant saying, you know, what he says about me. And when I have the impact that I have on some of these guys that are in the league, these, the younger generation, and I listen to these guys and they say who their favorite player was or I impact the Jalen Browns, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the Seth Curry's when they say that they I'm their favorite player. Like that's the shit that matters to me. The Absolutely. impact on, on the next generation. That's most impactful to me. You know what For I mean? Sure. I always uh, tell people along those same lines and for you, it's the next generation, but it's like for, for me personally, nothing gets me going more than the acceptance and approval of your peers because ultimately like yeah we all got tough skin and you know we all can have the 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 fuck it mentality right like oh well but when you have the approval and acceptance of your peers 
that goes way further far, yeah, than anything far else. Far beyond of what, you know, somebody outside of our game has, you know, what their opinion means. It, 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 no. That doesn't carry any weight. But when mm-hmm. your peers, you know, validate you, that's all you need. Absolutely. Like he was that dude, man. He was tough as shit. He was the toughest guy. Like, come on, man. Like, that's not play with this. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was nice, bro. <laughs> I know I was fucking nice. Like, you ain't about to shit here and tell me because I ain't win no championship that I ain't validated. Man, fuck out of here, bro. I don't hear that shit. Absolutely. No and the way. reality is this. There's only a select few of the guy, right? Like, you're the guy. Like, I've won a championships. I won three championships. I'm not the guy. Like, Steph Curry's the guy. Klay Thompson's the guy. Kevin Durant's the guy. I do my part. I am very important to what we do. Right. But those guys are the guy. They have to carry the scoring load. They have to do a, like. And the reality is, if you look at the NBA and you really understand the NBA, every decade, there's really one, two, maybe three guys Eight. that actually win championships. Teams. 2000s is the Spurs and the Lakers. 2010s is us and LeBron. And then you like, you know, Dirk got a championship. Yeah. Kawhi got a championship. But yeah. most far is every decade, the 90s is uh, uh, you got Hakeem, them got a couple. Yep. But the Bulls dominate. Like every decade, yeah. there's two, maybe three of the guy yeah. that actually wins championships. Yeah. And there's yeah. and, and there's 30 teams. Let's be, let's, be, uh, let's be real. There's 30 teams. All 30 teams ain't trying to win a championship. No. They're not trying to win no. a championship. As long as they're, they're, their bottom line is good, they don't give a shit about no championship. And, and, Absolutely. And, and, and that, you know, is some of the star guys is the brunt of that. You know, mm-hmm. that, that plays for those type of franchises. They just mm-hmm. don't care. Let's, let's keep it above. Absolutely. Okay. No, 100%. You know, Joe Dumars, who's like a father figure to me, I always tell people, man, if, if, if I didn't meet Joe D uh, through Jordan when I was in high school, I'm not sure I'd be where I, was, I am today. Because they showed me that it was a life outside of Saginaw, Michigan, that was actually attainable. And that actually existed that I had no idea was attainable and that I could be that. And still having a close relationship with Joe D, one thing he's told me along the way, he said, Draymond, always remember this. Every year in the NBA, there's three, maybe four teams, if you're lucky, that's truly trying to win a championship. That's real. Three to four teams per year that are actually trying to win a championship and spot on. Yeah. That's real. spot on. That, that, no, that's, that's, that's real talk. You got game early. Mm-hmm. I didn't catch it till towards the end. <laughs> Absolutely. He's stressing yourself out like, man, meanwhile, everybody upstairs, they not, they not having that same stress you having. They no, want like, to have, have a good team so and keep hard, going. Man. And, and, and mm-hmm. then you look at, you, you looking across at some of your boys like, damn, man. They rolling over there, bro. They got a well-oiled machine over there, motherfucker, man. They winning. They going deep in the playoffs. Damn, they're a contender. (laughs) Hey, I'm struggling trying to get in the damn (laughs) (laughs) playoffs. I definitely understand, (laughs) man. I definitely understand. But T-Mac, I appreciate you coming on um, and having this conversation with me. Um, Obviously, for coming on to the show is great, but just for me as a fan of yours, as someone who's come into this league behind everything that you did to carry this league to where it is and the impact, you know, I don't take for granted everything that you got you, yourself and guys who came before me did for this league because I, I know, like, yeah, I've done my, sh- my, my part in, like, my career, but I know the money wouldn't be where it is today. Yeah. The uh, the eyeballs wouldn't be there where they are today. My family doesn't live the life they live yep. if it's not for guys like yourself um, who who really push this lead forward. So one thing I want to put in the air before before we get out of here is you know I know um, you end up li- living living a dream of yours when when you 
play with Sugarland, um, Skeeters, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. <laughs> yeah, Sugarland Skeeters. Yes. So one thing I'm putting out in the world, we got D Way uh, in basketball ownership, who and now soccer, I think as well. Uh, D Way is doing a great job. I'm looking forward to seeing you owning that baseball team, my man. I know we've been <laughs> talking about everybody owning basketball teams and, and hearing that your first love is baseball, you know, and I know you've done well with your money and you continue to maintain the reputation that you had and the brand that you had. So I'm looking forward to you owning the baseball team, my brother. So, so I'm working my way up. I own a minor league team, so I'm working, hey now. working my way up to major league. Yes, sir. And I, uh, I have no I, I doubt that you'll get there. Yeah, man. I, no, I appreciate you, bro. Keep doing your thing. Uh, it's a lot of love on this side coming from me, bro. Get healthy. Uh, I want to see you back on that basketball court, man, and keep impacting and, and, and inspiring the youth, bro. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it, T-Mac. For sure. Love, Dougie. Wow. Was that an incredible interview? Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, as, I've, as I said earlier. Uh, you, not, not every day do you get, a, get the opportunity to talk to Hall of Famers and to hear their stories and hear their take on things and hear T-Mac talk about championships. I mean, that that was beautiful. I, j I felt the passion spewing out of him when I asked the question, and I hope y'all did too. Um, I mean, that was incredible, incredible just to hear that. Because, you know, like as you heard in weeks prior, Winning a championship is not the only thing that makes you a winner. Uh, it's it's so hard to win a championship. So that's definitely not the only thing that makes you a winner. But as you know, a lot of people, they tend to say you didn't win a championship and and they correlate that with not being a winner. As someone who won three who's won three championships, I disagree. I know how hard it is to win a championship. It is extremely hard to do. Everything has to be going. I mean, let's just take 2019, for example. You couldn't have tell me, told me we weren't going to win a championship. Everything that could have possibly went wrong went wrong. In a matter of 48 hours, we lost Kevin Durant to what has been a career-ending injury for people uh, through over the years. And then 48 hours later, we lost Klay Thompson to what had been a career-ending injury for people throughout the years. And just like that, it's gone. So it's so hard to win a championship. That's definitely not the only thing uh, that makes you a winner. And that was beautiful um, listening to T-Mac and him, hearing him say that. But that's a wrap on this week of the Draymond Green Show. I thank you all for listening to the ninth episode. We will be back uh, with another great guest next week. I think that it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. And it may be something that we haven't done before. So we'll see. But make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and also, go follow the Volumes YouTube channel. Uh, you, you, you get an opportunity to see this beautiful face, if you do. <laughs> Draymond Green Show, ninth episode. It's been real. Until next week, much love.